Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Discovery. I hope you enjoyed last week's and this week's presentations of the world famous Discovery Seminar. And I hope you all came up with the understanding that this document that we call the Bible was not written by man, it was given to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai by God 3,300 years ago. Tonight, we're going to have what's called Discovery Encore looking at some of the hidden miracles, not just of what we find in the Torah, in the Bible, but also what we might find in nature and the world around us. So I'd just like to give you a two minute review of what we discussed last week on the Bible codes. If you remember, we looked at the very first verse of the Bible, Bereshit, Bara Elohim, et Shemayim, Bet Haaretz. And we noted that there was a pattern of sevens. Number one, there are seven letters seven words, there are 28 letters. And if you look at the three nouns, which are Elohim, Hashemayim, Ha'aretz, the numerical value, adding up all the value of the letters is 777, which is a, once again, a multiple of the number seven. You look at the verb bara, it comes out to be 203, which is a multiple of the number seven. You look at the first and last letter of the first and last word, comes down to 497, which again is multiple of seven. And if you look at the first and last letter of all of the words, it comes out to 1,393. Again, a multiple of seven. Altogether, the person who did the research, Mr. Ivan Pannon, over 100 years ago, found more than 50 combinations of the number seven. Let's take a little bit further look at this very first verse. And what do we see? We see it's not only the words that are very significant, but it's also the letters themselves. Let's look at the letter Aleph. Letter Aleph, we know, stands for Hashem. Why? Because Aleph is one. It's the first letter of the, of the Aleph Bet, and it has a numerical value of one. More than that, if you look at the Aleph, it's open on the top, it's open on the bottom, it's open on the left, it's open on the right. It's infinite. It expresses God's infinity. More than that, if you look at the actual way that the letter Aleph is written in the Sefer Torah, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner is the letter Yud. And then in the lower left-hand corner is an upside-down letter Yud. And connecting the two, going uh, horizontally down, is the letter Vav. The letter Yud is the value of 10 another 10 for the Yud, and six, which is the letter Vav, comes out to 26, which as many people know, is the numerical value of God's name, Yod, He, Vav, He. Even more than that, how do you spell the letter Aleph? In Hebrew, you spell it Aleph, Lamed, and Pe. That's how you spell out the word Aleph. Again, Aleph is one, the numerical value of the letter Lamed is 30, and the numerical value of the letter pay is 80. 80 plus 30 plus 1 equals 111. 1, 1, 1. Hu haya, hu hove, hu hie. God was one, he is one, and he always will be one. Let's go back to that asuk. And the world was empty. Ruach Elohim and the Spirit of God, Merchefet al Penehamayim, hovered over the waters. What well, waters? We created the heavens and the earth. Who says anything about waters? So some of you might know that the Greek word for water is hydro. Hydro, you know, like a hydroelectric plant, which is something run by the water power. Or today, nowadays, we need to be hydrated. We need to have a lot of water in our body. That's the word hydro. But the Greeks weren't just talking about any water. They're talking about the water of Genesis. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. The Greeks also had another comment about the early universe. And they said that the entire world was made up of what they called Chiyuli. Chiyuli. Ramban brings it down in his commentary, and he says, in the beginning, the only thing that God created was a substanceless substance. 
which is called Chiyuli. Chiyuli in plural, I guess, would be Chiyulim. So if we look at these two words, we have water, and we have Chiyulim, we have hydrogen, and we have helium. Today, scientists tell us that the universe is 99.9% .9 hydrogen and helium. Exactly what Ramban said, that from that hydrogen and helium, that substanceless substance, these gases, from there, that's the only thing Hashem created, and from there, the rest of the universe was created. Ramban also points out, he says, you see the word Elohim, Amid, Aleph, Lamed, He, Yud, Mem? He says, don't read it as Elohim. Read it as Kel Hayam, master, the power of all the waters. Maybe that's an explanation of what the Spirit of God was doing over the waters. God said, Yehi or, let there be light. And there was light. Vayar Elohim et haor ki tov. And God saw that the light was good. We know neshama is ner, the neshama of a person is like a candle. The Torah or the Torah is considered light. Hashem looked and he saw that the Torah was good. Who doesn't say that? Vayar Elohim et haor kitov. He looked at the light and he saw the, the light was good. The Torah is light. The 613 positive and negative commandments of the Torah is what brings light to the world. And if you look at the words et, which Aleph and Taf is 401, Ha'or is 212, add them together, and it comes out to be exactly 613. God looked at Torah and he said, behold, the Torah is good. Aleph. Aleph has Hashem. Aleph is the most important letter that we have. So let me ask you a question. If the Aleph is so important, and the Torah is the most important book ever brought down, and it gives us the basis of life, why doesn't the most important book begin with the letter Aleph? Why does it begin with the letter Bet? Hashem says, Yes, the Aleph is infinite. It's open on all sides. But if you want to learn about the universe, you can't go back. You could only go forward into Bara, into the universe. The bet is closed on the top, on the bottom, and in the back. Don't try and go back. Don't ask questions what happened before the creation of the world. You want to see my universe? You got to go forward. Take a look. What do we see when we go forward? We look at the universe. And we look at a universe that's expanding. And how is it expanding? Well, it's traveling. If it started from one central point, it's going out. Where is the Earth in the entire universe? We don't know. Are we in the middle? Nice to think so. But I don't think we say that it is. We could be anywhere. We on the Earth are traveling at a thousand miles an hour. How's that? Well, the diameter of the Earth is approximately 24,000 miles uh, around at the equator. And when we rotate on our axis every 24 hours, we're traveling a thousand miles an hour. Not only that, we are also rotating, revolving around the sun. And the sun being 93 million miles away, again, if you figure out what the diameter is, and it takes us 365 and a quarter days to make that complete rotation. So we are traveling around the sun at 20 miles per second. I know it's been windy these last couple of days, but I don't feel a wind blowing at 20 miles per second. Not only that, our entire galaxy, the Milky Way, is traveling through space and is traveling at approximately 
720,000 miles per hour. Not just us. All the stars of the universe, not just our galaxy. So there is some star, some galaxy, that's all the way at the end of the universe. Where is it? What is it expanding into? What's on the other side of the end of the universe? Nothingness. We call that other side Hashem. Hashem fills not only the entire universe, but everything that there is, is made up of Hashem. Let's go back and look at the earth. There, in chapter 5, the, we look at the generations of man. And it says in chapter 5, Zachar unkeva bara otam. God created man and female, male and female. Bekara et shemam Adam. And he called their name Adam. Why Adam? It's very interesting because in the fifth chapter where God calls us Adam, we had just finished the entire episode of Adam and Eve and the snake. And what does God tell man afterwards? He says, Ki afarata, you're dust. Be'od afarata shuv. And you're going back to the dust. So call our name Afar. Call our name Aretz. Why are we named Adam? Well, it says we're named after Adama, but we don't come from the Adama. According to Hashem, we come from Afar. What is the extraordinary significance of the word Adam? Our rabbis tell us that every child that's born has three partners. It's God, has the mother, and has the father. The God supplies to the child the spiritual side, and the parents supply the physical side. Looking at the word Adam, we have the letter Aleph. Aleph, as we say, is one, Hashem. What is left if you take away the Aleph from Adam? You have the word Dam. Everybody knows the word Dam is blood. The Dam is the life force of the human body. We are commanded so many times, unlike what the Christians say, we cannot eat blood, we cannot touch blood, we cannot have blood in the food that we eat. It is the Adam Hu Hanafesh. The Adam represents a life force inside a human being. What is the numerical value of Dam? Dalit is four and Mem is 40. 44. Again, what is the significance of Dam? So as we said, a person has Hashem as a partner, and he has the mother, and he has the father. Kabud ab fa'em. That's what we, what we commanded. We have to honor our father and our mother. What is our father? Our father is our av. Again, numerical value of the father. First, he is one, and then when he has a child, he is two. Aleph and bet, two plus one equals three. Not true about the mother. The mother is, again, she's one, but she doesn't have to wait until the child is born until she becomes the mother. After 40 days, the value of Mem, the fetus inside of her is considered to be a child, a living child. 40 plus one is 41, plus the father is 44, equals Dam. This is a pictorial animation of what a human cell is. I have no idea what all these things are, and I have no idea what they do. But I do know one thing. I remember from seventh grade biology, our teachers told us that every cell in the human body has 46 chromosomes. What's a chromosome? A chromosome determines whether a person will be tall or short or dark or light or blonde, or brunette, or have brown eyes, or green eyes, or blue eyes. Just like the Hebrew letters, the chromosomes determine what the person's going to be. The Zohar tells us that the father gives 22 letters to the child, and the mother gives 22 letters to the child. Every cell contains 
46 chromosomes except two. The female egg, zygote, and the male sperm that he supplies to the child. The man gives 22 letters and Hashem gives one, that's 23. And the woman gives 22 letters. Hashem gives one is 23. 23 and 23 match together, forms a child with 46 chromosomes. That is the extraordinary meaning of the word Adam. But there's another meaning. Take a look at that. What is that? It's a cow, right? What does a cow say? I know what you're going to say. A cow says, moo. No, I'm sorry. A cow doesn't say moo. A cow, if, if you look in a cartoon and they're animating the face, yeah, it'll say moo. But he doesn't move his mouth and say M and, and O, O, O. A cow says exactly what your teenage son says every morning when you wake him up for school or for shul. A cow says, mmm. That's what a cow says. Similarly, a baby. And if you were looking at this picture, first of all, my sympathy is to whoever the parents of this child is. If you were looking at this picture in a comic strip, what would it say that this child is saying? It would say this child is saying, wah. The child is not saying, wah. The child is saying, ah. And he says it over and over. Ah, ah, ah. I, I know, you know, children, grandchildren, you get to hear that sound over and over. But that goes on only for a couple of months. Afterwards, what does a child say? The child looks at the father and goes, da, da, da. oh, bring such a smile to the face of the father. And then after a while, after he learns to use his tongue, he learns to use his mouth and he learns to say, ma, 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 ma. And he smiles and everybody smiles. What is the child saying? The child is saying, ah, da, Ma, put it together, you get the word Adam. Now, this is not conclusive proof of why we're called Adam, but it's much too coincidental for this to be a chance happening. Can't be. Let me show you just a few more things about this word Adam. Some of you might be familiar. This is the Shulchan Aruch. It is called the Set Table was written by Rabbi Yosef Karo, living about 450 years ago. He wrote this as the definitive work of Jewish law. It's a, it, is, it outlines all of the positive and negative commandments that we have, as well as all the hundreds of laws that the rabbis have come up with over the generations. He begins this most important work by telling us that every day we have to thank God for the wonder called the human body. That Hashem gave to us. And he enumerates three inexplicable miracles of the body. Number one, he says, our body is a balloon. And normally, if you puncture a hole in a balloon filled with air or filled with water, everything inside comes out. We have four holes, not just one. And air comes in from two of them, and waste material exits from the other two. And why doesn't everything just flow out whenever it feels like it? Because Hashem has given us sphincters and valves. He gave us the ability to control the exits, to keep us clean, and to avoid embarrassment. How interesting. But what do you call a human being that doesn't breathe? One of two things. He's either called a cadaver, or he's called a fetus. We all know that when life ends, so does breathing. But before birth, a fetus doesn't breathe the same way that we do. Its lungs are inoperable. So what happens to the blood that normally flows from the heart to the lungs and back into the heart and then into the body? For, it goes into the lungs to pick up oxygen. It doesn't happen. The baby is floating in water. So there's an opening 
in the, in the upper chamber of the unborn child's heart that allows the blood to bypass the lungs and recirculate directly into the body. Miraculously, at birth, that valve closes. The baby, now in this world, begins to breathe. Joseph Caro calls that a miracle. Number two, the body knows how to separate the waste material from the nutrients in the food. How? Okay, let's take a look at a typical Shabbat meal. Now I am Sephardic. So, Shabbat meal on Saturday afternoon usually consists of kibbeh, tahine, hummus, salads, chicken, spaghetti, potatoes, rice, peas, challah, wine, juice, soda, water, cake, cookies, cantaloupe, watermelon, and sleep. Now, if you're Ashkenaz, just substitute chulent and kugel for the kibbeh and spaghetti. The blood takes all the nutrients, all the minerals, and the oxygen from these foods and from the lungs, and delivers the exact combination of materials that are needed by the bones, the organs, and the brain, and the muscles, each an exact measurement and formula needed to nourish the different parts and organs of the body. How does the blood know how to do that? I mean, even FedEx and UPS make delivery mistakes, have to make returns. What intelligence stands at the end of your heart and says, okay, blood, you go here and you go there? Not only that, we have one plumbing system, veins and arteries. How is it that the same plumbing system that delivers the nutrients also picks up all the waste materials and carries it back to the kidneys, to the liver, and to the intestines for elimination? Doesn't that just serve to muddy the waters? Joseph Kara calls that another miracle. Number three, the body and the soul are united in one being. The soul, as we said, is the life force. If a doctor walked into a hospital room and there was a patient that is dead in a hospital, what he sees is a normal looking body. The only difference is that the soul has left. Where did it reside? Where did it go? How did it give life to the body? Ladies and gentlemen, that's a miracle. God has revealed to us many miracles. He's given us some wondrous organs in our body. Let's take a look at just one. The human eye. Beautiful human eye. Now, the eye is miraculous. I will tell you later how fast it works and how how delicate it is, but it's not perfect. As every driver knows when he's driving, he has a blind spot. That's the area right over your left shoulder and a few feet back. The mirror, the mirror that you have on the side doesn't always show that exact position unless you look for it. So that's why when you're driving and you want to pass a car on the left, it's always best to look over your shoulder to make sure there's no other car there. Why? Because in your eye, you have a blind spot. We have a blind spot in our actual eyes as well as in the car. When the eye begins to form in an unborn baby, protruding from the back of the eyeball is the optic nerve, which contains about 50,000 individual nerve fibers. Coincidentally, if you believe that the child forms totally by accident, coincidentally, the brain also starts developing the other end of the optic nerve, also with 50,000 nerve fibers. In terms of space, the distance between the two is millimeters. But in terms of cellular slice, that's the equivalent of millions of miles. And over a very short period of time, the two ends find themselves. And in the middle of millions of nerve endings throughout the head, they join each other seamlessly, accurately, matching all 100,000 fibers. But where the optic nerve joins the back of the eyeball, there are no rods and cones. As we know, the retina has the rods and cones, which receives the light sensations. There are no rods and cones where the optic nerve joins the back of the retina. So anything viewed in that exact spot is invisible. I want you to try this experiment. Take an ace of spades, as an ace of spades, and I want you to hold it in front of one eye, about 18 inches in front of one eye, and 
a little bit off to the side, trumpet it back and forth, in and out, just a little bit till it gets to a certain spot. Keep both eyes open. Don't look at the card. Look straight ahead. And when it reaches a certain spot, that spade in the center is going to disappear. Why? Because of your blind spot. Of course, you know that the spade is there. You just can't see it. Now, I want you to try another experiment. Find an ace of spades from an old deck of cards, not the deck of cards that I had, because once you do this part of the experiment, the deck of cards will never be the same and no sense in ruining a whole good deck of cards. Take a black marker and draw thick lines up and down across the deck, the ace of spades, and make sure that one set of lines goes right through the center of the ace of spades. And do the same exact thing with the card and trumpet it back and forth front of your eye, about 18 inches apart, uh, 18 inches away. Again, don't look at the card, look at straight ahead. And again, you will notice when it hits that spot, the spade in the center lifts off. But you'll notice something very strange. The grid lines that you, that you made remained, even where the spade was. How could that be? The eye lifted the spade off the card, but the lines that were in the same exact spot weren't affected. What about your blind spot? But now ask a better question. If you have a blind spot in your eye, why don't you see black holes everywhere where you look? Because it seems that the brain is filling in the blanks. Your brain knew that there were lines on the card. It calculated that since all the other lines were complete, Therefore, the two lines that cross under the spade must also be complete. So it filled in the blank. When you look at a wall or a table or even the sky or even a small object at small close proximity, the brain knows that these are solid objects and makes them appear to you as solid. There's only one problem. See, scientists know if you go back and you think once again to seventh grade or eighth grade or ninth grade science, and you think about the atom, the atom in the center has protons and has neutrons, and it has electrons that are spinning all around. <clears throat> but inside that atom is 99% empty space. There's nothing there. Empty. Nada. So how is it that we perceive solid objects how can we see it and how could we actually feel it if everything in the universe made up of atoms is 99 percent empty space now don't fall off your chair because your chair doesn't really exist neither do you it seems that god is letting us see things that don't really exist rabbi shimshon raphael hirsch one of the leading Jewish rabbis in the 1800s, he wrote, without the belief in the supernatural, we could never be sure that scientists aren't, are not deducing dreams from dreams and proving dreams with dreams. When we think, see things with our eyes, we are actually creating a physical reality in our brain, whatever physical is. The neurons of the brain make certain connections which retain that sight in our memory. If acted on properly, brain itself, your brain can bring to the forefront the face of every person you looked at as you walked down the street. You can see your childhood friends, and you can actually visualize the, ro the room that you grew up in. Think about this. You ever see a picture of the Kotel? Maybe you've seen the Kotel thing, Baruch Hashem. You this picture of the Kotel with all the people praying in front, the grass and the trees growing out of the stones with that famous little dome picture in the back. It's clear, right? What about the front door of your house? You've passed it a hundred times. You know exactly what it looks like. And think about that picture of the Warsaw Ghetto. You know the one where the young boy wearing his overcoat and his cap is lifting up his arms in surrender with a petrified look on his face as the SS guard stands behind him with a rifle? If you've seen it once, you'll always remember it. Because the, the brain retains everything that your eye sees. The eyes are miraculous. They process 
a billion MIPS. What's a MIP? A MIP is a million images per second. A billion MIPS, one million times faster than the fastest computers. They provide us with one set of vision for daytime, viewing in color, technicolor, infinite number of colors, and another way of looking at things, in black and white, at nighttime. They're synchronized, they're coordinated, they're complementary, and they're fast. Yes, we have miracles. We have miracles all the time. Let's talk about one of the miracles of nature. Now we know the caterpillars turn into butterflies and tadpoles turn into frogs. And very often teenagers turn into responsible adults. There are countless natural wonders that occur on earth every day. But monkeys turning into man, I don't know anyone who's ever witnessed that. But as the theory goes, if we wait a few million years, perhaps we'll live to see it. That's the theory of evolution. It says that it can answer every question about how we got here. So let's see if we can use their theory to answer the following question. We know that the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. Any further away, we would freeze. Any closer, we would fry. Any bigger, we'd be toast. Any smaller, would be ice. If the earth didn't rotate, one half of the surface would be as dry as a desert. If the axis wasn't tilted, the fields would have no rest. If the atmosphere was any thicker, the sun would not be able to evaporate the waters of the seas and there'd be no clouds. If gravity were any weaker, rain would not fall from the sky. But if gravity was any stronger, we would be able to get out of bed in the morning, which is hot enough uh, as it is. As far as we know, the Earth is the only place in our galaxy that has naturally occurring water, because we know water only is, exists as a liquid between 32 degrees and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Without water, there's no organic life. If there was no wind, the continents would not be fertile, it would only be fertile at the shores, much like in Egypt, where they wait for the waters of a Nile to overflow. Wherever it rains, it would just rain over the oceans because there's no wind. The clouds are there because the water evaporated from the oceans up into the clouds, into the sky. There's no wind. The only place we would have any type of vegetation would be on the shores. If the wind didn't blow, carbon dioxide there's only a small portion of the air we breathe would never reach the plants and there would be no food. No food, no monkeys to turn into men. So here's the question. If everything evolved by accident, how did this sun, wind, gravity, water cycle evolve so precisely that it allows for the survival of intelligent life on our planet for thousands of years. Is that just plain old dumb luck? Or is it because God willed that it should be that way? God created many things. At the instant of creation, Hashem said, Yehi or, let there be light. And as we know, light is a wave. And here we see in front of you the beautiful colors of the rainbow. And as we know, all the colors have different frequencies, different wavelengths. What is a wavelength? The distance, you see the little gimal over there, which stands for gamma. The wavelength is from crest to crest or trough to trough. The distance between them is the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the shorter the frequency or the higher the frequency. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Because light of every color always travels at the same speed. Now don't take my word for this because it's very hard to believe, but check this out for yourself. There is a standard scientific experiment that has been duplicated on hundreds of laboratories around the world. It leaves scientists perplexed and indeed it should. It's called simply the double slit experiment. I'll try to explain it to you in the clearest, easiest way possible. If you don't follow, look it up. Now, to conduct the experiment, you need a few basic items. 
The first is sunlight or flashlight. The second is a type of flashlight called a maser gun. Then you need a piece of cardboard with two thin slits in it. That's where you get the name of it, the double slit experiment. And finally, you need a piece of photographic film to record how light is coming through the slits. Now, the experiment is performed in several different ways. I take this light and it flows through the two slits in the cardboard. When the light passes through, it hits the film behind. And then as you would expect, when the light passes, it, it, it would leave an, exp an, an exposure. Now, if I only open one, I'm going to get one single line. And it's going to have fuzzy as edges. If you haven't noticed, you look at you sitting in your living room, in your dining room, where the sun shines through your windows, or you have the blinds in the front, you will see the shadow of the light on the floor. And the light isn't exactly perfectly straight at each edge. There's a little bit of haziness on the sides. That's because of the bending of the light waves as it hits the barrier of your window. The same thing. If I opened one of these slits, I would have one fuzzy line exposed on the photographic film. If I closed one and I opened up the other, then I would get that same line, little distant apart, and it would have the same fuzzy lines. But now if I open both of them, as you can see, the waves going through the two slits, just like if you drop two pebbles into a pond, it travels out in the form of a wave. And because we have interference between the two waves, I have a trough that supports a trough giving me darkness. And I have a crest supporting a crest, which gives me brightness. And then I have everything in between. As you can see, I have light and dark and dark and bright and bright and very bright and dark and dark. And that's standard because, as we know, light is a wave. The only problem is Albert Einstein proved that light is a particle. That means it's a distinct entity of matter. Did you ever run for an elevator? And if there's people in there, you say, wait, hold the elevator, hold the elevator. And sometimes they try and hit the open door button. So most of the times they hit the closed door button, intentionally or not. So what do they do sometimes? They'll go like this, and they put their hand in between the closing door and the elevator wall, and the door all suddenly will open again. Why is that? Because if you look inside the door, there's a little flashlight. And the flashlight is shining on the fixed end of the elevator door. And there's a mirror. And reflecting back to that flashlight, which there is a sensor, it's picking up the fact that the light particles are flowing back and forth from the flashlight to the mirror, back to the sensor. And when you break that, it senses the particles have stopped flowing. Somebody is in the way of the door, and the door opens. That's because light is a particle. So now, let's do this experiment again. Now we have electron beam gun, called a maser gun. And it's going to shoot one electron at a time, one photon, one particle of light through the slits. And again, we do the experiment the same way. First, we close one of the slits. We shine the light through. And once again, you have that same one line with the fuzzy edges. Close the first slit, open the second slit, and you get that same exposure a little bit further away on the photographic film in the back. One line with the fuzzy ends. Now, open both of them, and you get that same wave pattern again. Now, wait a minute. No. How could you get a wave pattern? You just said that light is a particle. Not only that, there's nothing to cancel out because matter doesn't cancel matter. Only waves do that. Furthermore, we're only releasing one particle at a time. So even if it was a wave, how could such a thing happen? Scientists don't understand. So wait a minute, maybe something funny is going on. So what you do is you put a monitor, like a Geiger counter, like we used to remember Geiger counters, and you put a monitor on one of the slits 
to determine if it's really a particle that's going through or maybe a wave. And indeed, it detects that one full particle is going through the slit. But now, since you put the monitor on, and if you open up both slits, instead of, instead of getting the, the wave pattern again, which is the light, dark, very bright and dark and light, you're getting the two fuzzy lines again, as if first one of the slits was open and then closed, and the other one was closed and then opened. Can that be? It seems that the light not only knows that it's being watched, but it can feel when there's one slit open or two. Light, energy, photons, electrons, no matter what you call them, they can't know anything. And furthermore, why should they care? Wait a minute. <laughs> they can't care? Even if we say they're intelligent, we never said that they're emotional. But the light seems to care, and they definitely know. You can understand why scientists puzzle. Ladies and gentlemen, if we look at light as a wave, it's a wave. If we assume it's a particle and we measure it as a particle, it's a particle. We see the world as we assume it exists. If we look at this world as a physical entity, it's only physical. If we look at it as a world, a spiritual world created by God, and we live our life as a spirit, life automatically becomes spiritual. Let's talk about life again. Where does life begin? Very simple. It says in Torah, in Bereshi, is God spoke to the waters in the land and commanded them to bring forth living beings. That's it. One statement about the origin of life on our planet. God said so. Volumes have been written in the scientific and philosophical world about the origin of life. Everyone, from Socrates to Aristotle and Plato to Charles Darwin and Stephen Hawkins, have put forth their theories about how life began. So, let's play devil's advocate a moment. Let's take their theory of evolution and understand. If God created light, and from light we got matter, how did that matter become organic? There isn't a scientist living or dead today who can explain how light began to grow. But that's the simple part. Scientists speak about this primordial soup of amino essence that ran randomly combined to form the earliest living cells. The most widely accepted theory states that for many, 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 many years, all of the organisms that existed on Earth consisted of just one single cell. No Venus flytraps, no Chilean bats, no dinosaurs. Just complex, one-cell beings that contained within them the same components that exist today in the cells of all living, living organisms. Ribosomes, nuclei, chromosomes, as we said before, and more. And as these cells consume more of the nutrients surrounding them, they grew ever larger and fatter and obese. And as they peruse their environment, they realized that fat wasn't where it's at. And if they wanted to continue to survive, they have to make a decision. Either lose weight or divide themselves into two. Lucky, luckily for us, they chose the latter. Suddenly, in what is called the Cambrian explosion, every genus, every phyla that we have today, and perhaps some that are no longer around, came into being. That included, according to science, the potential for every variety of plant, fish, bird, and animal. Only one problem. Who made that decision? Do we think that the, the unthinking mass of protons, neutrons, and electrons decided that existence was worth existing, and then on its own, they developed the capability of reproducing itself? Where'd they get that from? That would imply that life at all levels is worth perpetuating, that the continued survival of each species, and in fact, every individual cell 
serve some purpose that transcends its own intrinsic existence. Otherwise, why bother? Where did these cells come from? What do they perform? What miracles are there that allows life to continue? So, any idea what this is? You're probably looking at it and say, well, it looks like a green shoelace. Or I know what it is. You know, when you tie a, a birthday present, you have the ribbon around and you tie the ribbon up on top and you take a scissor and you zoop the end of it and it curls all like that. It makes a little ribbon like that. That's what that is. No. Close, but not cigar. No cigar. That is actually an amino acid that is assembling itself into a protein coil. You knew that, right? I, I know you knew that. In 1999, IBM undertook an initiative called Project Blue Gene. IBM was known as Big Blue, so they took on the name Project Blue, and Gene is G and E, as in what goes on in a cell. It cost over $100 million, and the price tag is still growing. It was upgraded in 2004. It was upgraded again in 2007, upgraded again in 2012. What was it for? It was designed to imitate the process whereby a human body cell assembles the amino acids into a protein in the exact sequences as directed by the body's individual DNA and bundles the, then it bundles the protein into a coil. If it was successful, the program would help scientists to understand how proteins develop and possibly lead them to understanding how they can cure diseases and allergies. A very noble cause indeed. Each computer was the size of a refrigerator. Each one contained a minimum of 1,064 individual computer nodes and when completed was capable of performing a petaflop. A petaflop. Not a Broadway flop, a petaflop. What is a petaflop? A petaflop is one quadrillion calculations per second. That's a one followed by 15 zeros. That's a lot faster than your Dell Pentium, let me tell you. So the first prototype was finally put into service in 2004. And they began testing with one of the simpler proteins of the body, containing only 300 amino acids, even though a body cell usually will assemble about 600 amino acids into each protein component. Am I losing you yet? Wait. Why only half the average size? Because as you can imagine, the more variables that there are, the greater the amount of permutations, the longer it would take to process. When all was said and done, the simulation was accomplished. A very wonderful discovery. The problem is, it took 24 hours a day for 365 days, and that's at petaflop speeds. By means of a comparison, the cells in your body can do that in what's called a millisecond. That means the cells of your body are more than 500,000 times faster than the world's largest, fastest, smartest, costliest man-made computer. Who did that? Who came up with that? Adam. This is the miracle of mankind. The miracles don't only extend to mankind, they also extend to the animal world. This, as you can probably tell, is a chicken hatching from an egg. If you've ever cracked open an egg, you know that you have the yolk, which eventually is the chicken. If it's fertilized and it's hatched, and all that goo around it are all the nutrients that it needs to grow from the embryo into the chicken ready to pop itself out of its shell. It stays there, it consumes that goo, and when it's large enough, it breaks open the shell. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an alligator. Now you will notice, that the alligator shell uh, egg is a lot bigger and it's also a lot thicker. What would happen if the chicken egg was as thick as an alligator egg? 
you'd never have another chicken. Now, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, but if the chicken came first, you'd never have another one because that little baby chick would never be able to peck its way out of an egg if the, the shell was too thick. What about the alligator? What happens if the alligator had an egg shell that was as thin as the chickens? Well, you'd never have any more alligators because by the time the mother tried to give birth or hatch that, produce that egg, it would be nothing but goo. The shell would crack. Fish, fowls, reptiles, insects, all unrelated species, unrelated genus. Many of them lay eggs. Each one is packed with the nutrients that a baby needs to develop until it's strong enough to make its way into this world. Each shell, not too thin and not too thick, just right to withstand the pressure of egg birth, but not too thick. The baby can peck its way out. How did it happen? Were these just multiple accidents of nature? Or was this planned parenthood by God? Miracles that occur even in the animal world. Finally, let's take a look, take a look at the world of plants, the tree. For those of you who have ever listened to any of the tapes from Rabbi Avigdor Miller, you understand the miracles of an apple seed and what an apple can produce. The seed, a little black dot, put it into the ground, and just as it disintegrates up from the, the seed itself, sprouts a little, a little branch. Soon you have a trunk, you have branches, you have leaves, you have buds, you have blossoms. I'm not sure which one comes first, a blood or a blossom, by a blossom or a bud. And you have an apple. And inside that apple are more seeds that you can take and you can plant. You do it again. What do you think about when you think of when you see a tree? I would say most people don't think at all. You've seen one tree, you've seen them all. Perhaps in autumn, when you see the beautiful colors, you, rem you remark at how beautiful the colors are of that tree. But otherwise, a tree is a tree. What does a tree represent? A tree signifies the bridge between this world and the next world. It has its roots in the ground and its head in Shamayim. Man has been called Ki Adam et Asadeh. We are the tree of the field. What does a tree do? A tree provides shelter and shade. It provides food. It provides coolness. It provides the building materials necessary to build homes, to build a world. Food, shelter, housing, shade, life-giving oxygen. Can we do any less than a tree? A tree prepares the world for growth. That's our job. We have to be an et asade. We've come full circle. We end where we began. Bereshit bara elokim. Letters, words, numbers, nature, science, morals, values, mankind, animals, and plants. One unified all, all of these in the Torah. Learn it, explore it, and enjoy it. Thank you very much, and good night.